Hello and welcome to the second edition of the Tyre Recycling Podcast. On this week's show, we're welcoming the first uh, interviewee in our Expert Witness series with Martin Van Wolfersdorf. I'm Richard Wilson, contributor to Tyre and Rubber Recycling, and as usual, I'm joined by Ewan Scott, editor for Tyre and Rubber Recycling. Ewan, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks, Richard. Um, like everyone else, I'm uh, missing the face-to-face interaction, but these online yeah. interviews are bringing some sense of normality to the working day. Yeah, that's true. I suppose I say this is once again this is the the only sort of interaction we can have right now via via digital software like this. This is the best thing we can do. But so talking of these types of interactions, you had your first um, had your first interview in the expert witness series with. Martin von Wolfersdorf, uh, the managing director of Wolfersdorf Consulting, and and it's an extended interview, so we've got two parts. The first part is obviously coming up today. So, what did you manage to ask Martin in part one? Well, in this episode, we hear from Martin von Wolfersdorf on the the changing dynamics of the tire pyrolysis sector. I know that the tire manufacturers have uh, shown a great deal of interest in the the sector. It, um, it, it changes the whole nature of the business. We also hear about the, the challenge of refining uh, raw recovered carbon black into something marketable, uh, which again has been a, an ongoing challenge for the industry. And as the market demands more products and uh, greater cons- consistency, uh, this has become uh, more and more important. Interesting. So that sounds quite, That's quite good to start off. So we've, without any further ado, without any more waiting around, we've got the first part of the interview coming up for you right now. Martin, you're one of the most experienced consultants in the tire pyrolysis sector. Uh, and you have a wider background in carbon black. Can you tell our viewers uh, and our readers how you see the market for pyrolysis recovered carbon black? Yes, of course. Uh, And one thing has to be said, there's a market before and there's a market uh, after the global corona slowdown. And um, I think there's a paradigm change going on. Uh, and the one paradigm change on the um, recovered carbon black market is about the growth uh, and the volume. And the second one is about the uh, the price. So the um, volume, what I see now, is really going up and uh, driven by the chemical recycling of the rubber polymer. And I see big chemical companies uh, wanting to integrate in that space. Um, and um, tire pyrolysis oil is interesting as a feedstock, a, um, a renewable feedstock, low carbon dioxide feedstock for the chemical and polymer industry. However, they need hundreds of thousands of tons uh, and of this uh, material. And the typical tire pyrolysis company uh, does not have sufficient scale for that. So there's growth. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, they also get the recovered carbon black. Uh, in tens of thousand tons and what to do with it. So that is something going on at the moment. And I see tire companies integrating, I see polymer companies and chemical companies integrating with the tire industry and that will provide growth. And um, that is very positive for the uh, recycling industry. The the second point is uh, about the price Um, and the industry, the rubber industry, slow down a lot, uh, like all the other uh, industries in the, um, and the uh, automotive value chain. And um, that, of course, had a negative effect on uh, carbon black pricing. And the carbon black pricing now is not very attractive. So the paradigm change for recovered carbon black is that now a uh, second quality recovered carbon black is not saleable anymore. It needs to be a really good recovered carbon black, low volatiles and uh, very good quality to be able uh, to be sold to the rubber and plastics industry. And such a recovered carbon black doesn't need to be much cheaper than virgin carbon black. 
uh, it could be around the price of virgin calm black could even be more expensive because it's a greener product uh, and it does specific things that normal carbon blacks uh, cannot do talking numbers um, i think and i did this uh, assessment uh, uh, last week for uh, uh, for a new client uh, in Europe, uh, this is the wider Europe, not EU28, but uh, including Russia, including Turkey, including Bosnia, and another uh, couple of companies uh, of countries that are not in the EU. I think the the market potential for recovered carbon black is about 180,000 tons. This is a big number, um, and um, what's even more interesting, I think, um, up to 2028. Uh, that could be some 330,000 tons, mainly driven by the tire industry seeking volumes. And the tire industry, um, I made some assumptions for getting to the 300,000 by 2028, uh, but uh, the major driver for the tire industry is not cost reduction. This is very positive, but uh, many of the tire companies have defined percentages of recycled materials they want to include in their tires. For example, Conti wants to go from 3% to 10% by 2025. Um, Michelin, Bridgestone have longer raging uh, targets. Uh, they want to go, I think, 16, 80%, but to 2050 and 2048. Uh, um, however, even a company like Pirelli, who for me a long time were least likely to uh, be interested in recycled materials because they are all about performance, high performance racing tires. Uh, even Pirelli has a target to go to uh, 3% by I think uh, 2025. So that is very positive. And now if I take that on a, co a conservative estimate and I don't say 3% of the whole tire, but I say 3% just of the carbon black in the tire, and I use that uh, for the uh, projections to 2028. Uh, that's a very positive uh, number. So this year, potential could be 180,000 tons in 2028, could be 330,000 tons. And as you know, the demand is nowhere there. Uh, uh, that's a very positive uh, number. So this year, Potential could be 180,000 tons in 2028, could be 330,000 tons. And as you know, the demand is nowhere there. Uh, the demand, uh, the uh, supply, sorry, as you know, the supply is nowhere there. Uh, the supply is much lower than the demand. Okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, if, if the market potential is as high as, uh, as you believe it to be, can you tell us what do you think is holding the market back? Yes, um, I think it, it is a very complex business, uh, far away from um, trash to treasure and waste to wealth. Um, there are so many aspects uh, to, to manage. Technology is only one, and, and yet because the capex, uh, technology capex perhaps is the, the, uh, the most in the eye of the investors, but uh, there is uh, regulation, there is permits, uh, then uh, finding out about the market. Many investors in tire paralysis, at that point when they are interested, they don't even know that tire paralysis does not produce carbon black, but it produces recovered carbon black, which is a different product, um, which can replace carbon black in, in applications, but it is not carbon black. So it's a long learning process. And I, I would say, the, the biggest hurdle for these companies uh, is funding, is really is the money. And I can see successful companies, they're uh, to be found not among the small startups who really have limited budget, but successful companies have already a cash flow engine and they have a tire paralysis business unit, a, a project they want to integrate. However, they have incoming cash flow uh, that allows them to uh, uh, to pay for that project all the time. Um, I think that's one of the success factors. And then, of course, every company has their own story. Um, there have been accidents, uh, fires, um, and many reasons why companies didn't grow as they intended to grow. Okay. Um, 
has a growing interest from the tire companies uh, in pyrolysis has become a game changer? Uh, we, we know of supply agreements with Michelin, Continental, Bridgestone, and uh, we can see a lot of activity in China. Um, and we've just seen Michelin uh, invest in PyroWave, mm. uh, dealing with recycling plastics with a view to including the polymers produced in synthetic rubber. Um, what, what impact is that having on the market? That is certainly one factor in, in scaling up. Um, I'm personally, I'm not aware of a Michelin supply agreement. Uh, I'm aware of the uh, investment into Scandinavian Enviro, which I take uh, very positive for, for the scaling up. And even with Michelin, as indicated on the previous uh, question, I think the major growth driver for that is uh, the oil more than the recovered carbon black but uh, there will be uh, an upside for the recovered carbon black because it will scale alongside uh, the oil. And I also think um, there's an um, advantage when you scale up, um, probably the um, quality consistency uh, will increase as well. And that's something that the industry is um, currently struggling with, that the small scale industry is struggling with because everybody's RCB is different. So if you put all them together, um, and compare the quality, they're quite different. However, when you have one large volume out of one production, uh, that is much more consistent quality than um, several RCBs uh, combined. And uh, that, that's a really positive um, driver for, for the industry. And again, I think it is um, by ecology, not so much as economy. And uh, I take uh, that very positively. Okay. Do we have uh, leading pyrolysis processes able to produce RCB suitable for inclusion in rubber or plastics in a, uh, a single step? Or do producers still need to refine uh, their char to get a usable end product? The properties of recovered carbon black are quite different um, from carbon black. Uh, starting with the composition. Uh, recovered carbon black is a mixture of at least four things. The um, carbon blacks of the tire, uh, which we are recovering. Uh, then there's an inorganic also called ash content, which is a mixture of zinc, uh, sulfur, and all the um, uh, inorganic content of the tire. And then we have two organic contents that are not so good, but uh, depending on the process, uh, we, we get them. Uh, and these are organic volatiles if the pyrolysis has not quite finished to, uh, to the end. Um, this is the um, rubber polymer that is sitting in form of a kind of oil on, on top of the recovered carbon black. Um, we can smell it sometimes if there's a lot uh, of uh, volatile contents. Uh, and then there's a solid form of fresh carbon uh, also called char or the, in the plastics pyrolysis world they call it uh, fixed carbon which is uh, also coming from the rubber polymer, which has been carbonized. And then um, this doesn't need to be a bad thing. Uh, in the rubber world it is because it inactivates the energy sites on top of the carbon blacks. Uh, and this uh, is one of the reasons for less reinforcement, along with the fact that the carbon blacks in the tire, that they are not all reinforcing. Um, but if we get that char, um, in plastics, it could be a bonus. We get more carbon material, um, and in the coloring world, we want uh, high carbon content and low ash content. Ash is a white pigment and carbon is a black pigment. So you could say recovered carbon black is a, a gray pigment, a dark gray pigment. And the more carbon we get, uh, the better the jetness uh, will be. Um, but answering the question uh, a little bit long-winded, uh, no, there is not uh, a process uh, that uh, can do this in uh, one step because uh, the uh, raw recovered carbon from the reactor has a particle size distribution that is very wide. Uh, that is anything between one micron and one millimeter. And one millimeter is too big a particle uh, to perform well in rubber or plastics. So we need to mill and uh, get the, uh, the particle size down. That is the least we need to do. But um, as you know, there's much more uh, we need to do to control the quality because um, the feedstock 
coming in uh, also is very important uh, for the quality coming out. And we need to control uh, the feedstock in a way that the chemical composition of the feedstock into the pyrolysis stays constant all the time. Only then we can get a consistent quality recovered carbon and oil as well uh, on, on the output side. Okay, um, we've seen presentations from uh, Dr. Chris Norris at Artis where RCB has placed in a large specification of uh, in, in a range of specifications rather than as, as a direct substitute. Uh, is that nebulous nature of uh, RCB specification challenge or an opportunity for the industry? I think uh, it is a challenge for the buyers. Um, when we put ourselves in the shoes of a buyer that buys carbon black, there is uh, defined categories, ASTM categories of carbon blacks, and you know what you get when you choose um, ASTM 772, you know exactly what you get and what kind of performance you get in the rubber. The same in the, in the plastics world, they might not use the ASTM nomenclature, but use uh, um, the, the old nomenclature like uh, SRF, semi-reinforcing furnace, um, or for a 300 uh, high abrasion furnace. Um, so they need to know what they buy in order to be able to buy. And, and that has been a hurdle for, for the industry. And I hear over and over um, the question, uh, when will there be quality categories for recovered carbon black? At the moment, they aren't. And um, for a recent um, uh, expert report I've wrote, uh, I defined three quality categories myself in the absence of quality categories from the ASTM D36 group. Uh, and I defined RCB1 as the top quality. Um, the best quality a recovered carbon black can have. Then an intermediate quality RCB2 that might be deficient in one or two parameters and RCB3, which is unfinished uh, um, raw recovered carbon black. And um, the supply in Europe um, is um, about 28 kilotons, which sounds large, uh, but about 15 kilotons of that uh, is the, the raw uh, version the uncontrolled uh, feedstock and unmilled um, raw recovered carbon black. About 10,000 tons, I would say, is uh, high quality uh, and about uh, the rest, uh, three, 4,000 tons is intermediate uh, quality. And uh, I think the industry um, could grow uh, much easier by filling certain quality categories so that uh, buyers know what they can buy. And we're back. Now, you and I thought part one was very interesting, some good things to come out of that. What do you think were the main highlights and takeaways from part one of the interview? We can see for sure that there is a rapidly changing dynamic in the pyrolysis state. After many years of, uh, of trials, tire manufacturers are finally getting uh, into RCB use and uh, the, the idea of using RCB to replace virgin carbon black. There are, of course, challenges, uh, but along, the, along with these challenges come opportunities. The tire pyrolysis sector and the rubber and plastic sectors uh, now need to work in harmony to create better use of recycled materials uh, from the pyrolysis processes. Hmm, okay, interesting, very true. And as always with these types of interviews, it's always good to hear sort from someone like Martin, considering his knowledge and experience, experience in the area. And I'm sure everyone will be waiting um, eagerly to see what we've got for part two. Anyway, thanks for your time today, Ewan, and thank you for your interview, Martin, for part one. And thank you to our listeners and viewers for tuning in. And we'll be returning shortly with another edition of the Tire Recycling Podcast and part two of our expert witness interview with Martin Van Wolferstorff. Until next time, stay safe.